Eric Lynn Wright, better known as Easy e was born 1964 in the dangerous streets of Compton, California that had a reputation for high crime rates and gang culture in the area. Due to the fact in the 1970s, Compton was decimated by gang wars between the Bloods and the Crips, with sets fighting over territory, drugs, women, and money. With Easy e seeing all this going on, he would adapt to his surroundings, with Easy e always wanting to be larger than life. He knew he would have to do some extraordinary things to get him and his family out of the predicament they were in. With his parents being two working class individuals, with his father being a postal worker and his mother working with the school board, it was enough to maintain, but not enough to get ahead in life. Even Easy e at first was trying to work regular jobs as a teen, but he just couldn't stand working for somebody else and having to adjust his schedule to a job. So Easy would start hustling on the streets as a teenager, getting introduced to the game by his cousin, Horace Butler, becoming a runner at first for his cousin. For you guys who don't know what a runner is, it is somebody who delivers goods to customers on a dealer's behalf. As a young teenager, Easy e would experience a lot of trials and tribulations while in the streets, from seeing friends and family get murdered to getting harassed by the police. By the time Easy e got to the 10th grade, he figured there wasn't no point to even go to school due to how busy he was getting in the streets and he didn't see his future involved in school anyways, so he would drop out. During his time in the streets, Easy e would amass a large fortune selling narcotics in the Compton area, with allegedly him making over a half a million dealing drugs by the time he was in his early 20s. Moving up from runner to becoming one of the biggest wholesalers of coke in Compton, selling the majority of his work to the crip sets of the surrounding area. But everything would change when Easy e cousin who introduced him to the game would be murdered, and it would cause Easy to realize he can't live this life forever. Easy would decide to start making his way into the music industry via hip hop. And at this time, hip hop would just begin to gain notoriety in the West Coast, beginning in the 70s with artists like Uncle Jam's Army and the World Class Wrecking Crew. In the mid 80s, Easy E would begin his journey setting up a studio in the garage of his parents' home and using it as a launching pad to get things started. This is where Dr. Dre would come into the fold. Dr. Dre at that time was a popular DJ in Compton and was in a group called World Class Wrecking Crew, a electro group consisting of members Dr. Dre, DJ Yella, Klein Tell, and Alonzo Williams. And Dre and Easy e already knew each other due to them growing up in the same neighborhood, with Dre starting to get to know him more personally due to him periodically recording tracks in the garage of Easy es parents' house. But in his early years, Dr. Dre would stay in trouble with the law, boiling over to where Dr. Dre would be arrested for thousands of dollars in unpaid parking tickets for his Mazda RX-7. This would happen a lot with Dre, which in cause would have him be in a lot of debt to world-class wrecking crew leader Alonzo Williams, who would bail Dre out every time he got in trouble. But this last time, Alonzo Williams had enough of bailing Dre out. With Dre having nobody else to call, he would call Easy e to pay the $900 bail. Easy e would bail Dre out, but with a proposition, and that's if Dre produced a couple tracks for Easy as part of his repayment, and Dre would agree to the deal. Dr. Dre was essential in the beginning due to the fact Dre had experience in the music industry to a certain extent with being in the world class wrecking crew and he knew how to properly mix, master, and produce a track for Easy. With a deal in place, Dre told him that he was already working with a group with Ice Cube called HBO out of New York and asked Easy e how he felt about investing into the group. Easy e would agree and put the money up to record at a real studio and see how things turned out, with intentions of pushing this group to the masses if all went well. Dre would also bring along Arabian Prince, who was a solo artist in his own right, around to studio sessions, building a family atmosphere at the beginning of it all. A couple songs would get recorded during this process period, but while in the studio one day, HBO wouldn't perform the lyrics that Ice Cube had wrote for them, with the song being titled, Boys in the Hood. With the group feeling, the lyrics was whack, which in cause would start an argument between everybody at the studio, forcing Easy to record the song himself, since Ice Cube couldn't record because he was already a part of a group. Easy e would lay down the vocals for the track called Boys in the Hood, and Dre would realize they have created a star, with Easy e exceeding expectations and the song would turn out to be a hit. Through the next couple of months, Easy e Dr. Dre, and Arabian Prince would sell records out the trunk of their cars and swap meets to make money at the beginning. With Easy and Dre getting the song to be played on the local radio station called 1580 K-Day, and it would go number one on the radio station for multiple weeks. 
but with all the success, Easy wanted to become bigger and actually get some real distribution behind them. This is where Jerry Heller would come into the picture. Heller and Easy would first meet in the summer of 1987 in the offices of McCullough Records. Alonzo Williams was set up to meet in between the two. Alonzo knew Heller because Heller was managing the world class wrecking crew and managing the group CIA. Easy would then play a couple tracks for Heller, but Boys in the Hood would catch Heller's ear, who would be impressed with the song. And from that point on, Heller and Easy would become business partners, officially creating Ruthless Records. Heller would front $250,000 of his own money to begin the label. In exchange, he was given a 20% cut from all of Ruthless Records' profits, but Easy still owned the business entirely himself. With this new deal in place, Easy e would have a talk with Dre, an Arabian prince, to start a group under his newfound label with all parties in agreement. Dre would recruit Ice Cube to join with them, forming the first formation of N.W.A. in early 1987, with MC Ren and DJ Yella joining later on that year. With Easy being cool with Ren in the streets and DJ Yella already being a close confidant to Dr. Dre, being in a world-class wrecking crew with him. The group would immediately get to work, officially releasing Easy es first single titled Boys in the Hood on March 3rd, 1987. With the song becoming a major success on Billboard, peaking number 50 on the Billboard Hot 100, leading to the group N.W.A. being a part of the compilation album N.W.A. and the Posse, which was really a bootleg according to Arabian Prince. With the album re-releasing N.W.A. and other local underground West Coast artist songs all on one project through McCullough Records. The album would help gain more traction for the group and build a bigger buzz for them. Setting up the red carpet for Easy e and N.W.A. to release their debut album titled Straight Outta Compton on August 8th, 1988, released through Priority Records. With the album becoming a major success for the group and was one of the most important albums in hip-hop history, opening up the mainstream to gangster rap with their hardcore lyrics and brash content. With most of the lyrics being written by Ice Cube, MC Ren, and the D.O.C., with songs like Express Yourself and F The Police being theme songs for all the ghettos around the world at that time, especially F The Police due to the fact everything that was going on with police brutality and LAPD's war against gangs and young black men in America. With the song gaining a lot of pushback from police departments across the country and even getting a letter from the FBI to stop before things get ugly and out of hand. The album would go on to peak number 9 on the Billboard Top R&B Hip Hop Album Charts and would be certified platinum. And Easy e the next month will follow up with his debut album titled Easy Does It on November 23rd, 1989. With this album being executive produced by Dr. Dre and DJ Yella. They would develop more a cohesive sound on this album than they did with the Straight Outta Compton album. Showcasing Easy's personality through his controversial lyrical content in his songs. Easy Does It would be another successful album for Ruthless, peaking number 12 on the top R&B hip hop album charts, with the album eventually being certified double platinum. At this point, Ruthless Records, N.W.A. and Easy e was on fire and was making a lot of money. And this is where the first problem would arise for the group, coming from Arabian Prince, with claims he wasn't getting paid for the work he had done through the years. With him accusing Jerry Heller of screwing the group out of millions of dollars, with tensions boiling over while on tour, Arabian Prince will leave N.W.A. abruptly. Once N.W.A. started to roll out, you didn't really hear about Arabian Prince. I bounced. I did okay. the whole Shark Tank. <laughs> okay. I'm out. So what yeah. happened? Um, well, that album and the album before. So when we did the first records, we were already touring. We were already doing shows and all of that kind of stuff. And then we started working on Straight Outta Compton. During that whole time, I was always asking like, dude, what's up on the money? You know what I mean? Because I was the only one in the group who actually had a solo career. Dre and Yella were under um, the wrecking crew. Alonzo. They never took care of the business, but I did my own business on my record. So I knew what royalties were, how much we should have been getting. And that first NWA thing blew up, you know what I mean? And I'm like, where's all that money? And every time I would ask, oh, talk to Easy, oh, talk to Jerry, we would never see that money. And it went on and on and on. So eventually I'm like, man, as a solo artist before, I stopped making my own records to do this group thing. It blew up, it was blowing up. We're not making money and we got hits. I made more money as a solo artist because at least I was getting my money direct. I might not sell a million copies, but all the money was coming to me and I can't even get enough money to pay my rent or to pay my car payment 
because I got to go through these hoops back and forth and, you know, with Jerry and trying to figure out what was up with our money. With the Arabian Prince leaving the group, it would cause a domino effect. With Ice Cube seeing what's going on and started asking questions himself, opening up his eyes to realizing there are only two people who are really enjoying the financial benefits of NWA success, which was Jerry Heller and Easy e with them both buying luxury cars and big mansions. With Cube still living at home with his parents and barely able to afford a sandwich, with everything Ice Cube had went through up to that point, he would officially leave NWA towards the end of 1989. And he would leave pretty easily, due to the fact he was the only one not on official paperwork with Ruthless Records. Leaving NWA with four members, with Dr. Dre, DJ Yella, MC Ren, and Easy e but through all the chaos and drama, Easy e would run Ruthless Records to be one of the most successful hip-hop labels of its time. With signing artists such as the D.O.C., J.J. Fad, and Michelle A., who will all release successful albums on their time with the label. On May 28, 1991, N.W.A. would release their second album, titled Niggas for Life, which would be their last album together. With the album peaking number one on the Billboard 200, becoming the first rap album by a rap group to top the charts. But the album would receive pretty bad reviews from critics, with the group clearly missing the writing and song structuring of Ice Cube, with the album being mediocre at best. But Ice Cube wouldn't like the album for other reasons, with him hearing a whole lot of subliminals about him throughout the album, which would set up Ice Cube to release one of the greatest diss tracks of all time, titled No Vaseline. Releasing on October 29th, 1991, two days before his sophomore album would release, and this song would cause a big uproar in gangsta rap. With Cube not holding any punches as he would throw shots at everyone in the remaining cast of N.W.A. and Jerry Heller. With the song being so scathing, the group as a whole wouldn't respond back and let Ice Cube have the W, according to DJ Yella. But bigger problems would arise when Dr. Dre would want out of Ruthless Records. This is when Suge Knight would come into the picture, who was already managing the D.O.C. Things would first start unfolding when the D.O.C. would get in a near fatal car crash, causing him to lose his voice. In turn, needing Suge to reconstruct his contract for him to benefit the most off his writing skills since he can no longer rap. Suge would look over the contracts and realize that the DOC was getting swindled out of millions of dollars and the DOC would tell Dr. Dre. And this is where Dre would find out he was getting swindled himself with a loophole in the contract to where basically Dre will always be in the hole no matter how many records he sold. Uh, take, me back, take me back to Dre and DOC. This is um, NWA. They're signed to Ruthless Records. This is just before Death Row. I think you're, at this point you're managing your Dre's personal manager. The story is that you got <clears throat> Dre and DOC out of their Ruthless Records deal. Correct. And th what I read, uh, they were handed over, no money exchanged. How did right. you pull that one? Doc, the DOC was a friend of mine. Right. And the guy had, um, he had a, a, a tragic, it was an accident. He was going home from one of his videos. He fell asleep. He was in the Honda Prelo. He got blew out the brakes in the windshield of the car from the back. Right. Everything else came back except his voice. So the guy ended up talking like Donald Duck, which is very <laughs> sad. The guy went from having the best voice in the rap game to having basically no voice. Right. And I tried to cheer him up. So I said, Well, look, one thing you can one thing you can count on that you write songs. Right. You don't wrote X amount of songs for Easy. You don't wrote X amount of songs for NWA. That's worth a lot of money to. Right. And, and so you get Dre, you got right. Doc. So I go into Doc's contract, and he sold his songs for a hundred dollar watch, a hundred fifty dollar chain. So what I seen, I never seen anything like it in the world. Right. So when I went to go get Doc's situation squared away, that's when Dre came. Right. Dre said, "Well, look, I'm not really from Compton. Everybody usually against me." He said, "I'm over here, ruthless, and I got this this deal that for a bonus, if I do two records." I'll probably get a swimming pool in my backyard. Right. I said, that's got to be crazy. What your, what your contract says? He said, I've never seen a contract. Right. I signed something, I've never seen it. I said, we got to get your contracts. After I got his contract, I read and I seen that the guy was only getting one point, two points, and it was cross-collateralizing everything. Right. Even though he was a producer, along with Yellow, if J.J. Fad go in the hole, right. he got to pay for it. Right. So it's no way, if he, if he produced and worked, for 20 years, he wouldn't have never seen any money. He was always been um, recouped. After Dr. Dre found out all the details, he would approach Easy and give him an ultimatum. Either pick him or Jerry Heller. Easy e would ultimately side with Jerry Heller and let Dre know he wasn't going to let him out of his contract neither. 
This is where things will escalate to violence because Dre would go on to set up Easy e to allegedly get cornered by Suge Knight and his people, forcing Easy e to sign release forms for Dr. Dre. He told us the story. He said that Dre called him, you know, to meet with him to, to sign over, you know, sign him, get him out the contracts or release him or whatever. But when he get there, Suge was there. So they was in a hotel room. Suge had dudes hiding in the closet under the bed. And when he get up there, when they, he get up there, Suge locked the door. All these cats come from under the bed and out the closet in the bathroom with guns. You know what I'm saying? And Dre was in there? Dre wasn't there. Oh, Dre wasn't there at nah. all? Nah. Dre set it up, though. Okay, so You know, because he didn't hate Dre. You know what I'm saying? As pe people try to portray, he didn't. Well, they, they was friends once Yeah, they time. were really close friends yeah. at one point. So you're, you're telling me that Dre called Easy for a meeting. For sure, though. But when Easy showed up, Dre wasn't there. Dre wasn't Suge there. was there. Suge was there. Yeah. Which, when you look at their relationship, it doesn't. This is not a stretch. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, when you look at how how Death Row operated. After forcing Easy E and Ruthless Records to sign the release forms, Easy E would sue Death Row for being forced to sign under distress. With ultimately Interscope getting Easy E to drop the lawsuit, and they would negotiate a deal to let Dre leave. Only if Easy and Ruthless Records get 20% of everything Dr. Dre made for the next six years while on Interscope Records. Every party would agree with these terms and Dr. Dre would officially leave Ruthless Records. And with all this controversy that happened for Dre to leave Ruthless Records, this will end up cultivating into a musical beef between Easy e and Dr. Dre. With Dre taking direct shots at Easy in 1992 on his debut album titled The Chronic on songs like Be Ain't Nothing and the well-known diss track Dre Day. With Dre on the songs depicting Easy as a sleazy businessman and Jerry Heller's puppet. And once Easy saw the music video of Dre Day, Easy had enough of the disrespect. On August 26, 1993, Easy E would release Real G's, featuring Drake and BG Knockout. And the song would attack Dre's street credibility, with Easy E in the song claiming Dre was never a real gangster and used to wear dresses and used to be a dancer when he was in a world class wrecking crew. And Easy would also expose to the public that every time you heard the song Dre Day, it was only Easy's payday. The song will also be a success, with the song peaking number 42 on the Billboard Hot 100. The two would drop a couple more diss tracks dissing each other and taking slick shots and in interviews, with Easy E releasing an EP dissing Dre titled His Own Dr. Dre 187 Killer. The EP would become a success, with the EP selling 110,000 copies in its first week, and it peaked number 5 on the Billboard 200. But ultimately, the beef would die out and everybody would slowly start minding their own business and stop taking shots at each other on wax. In late 1994, Eazy-E would introduce the world to the group Bone Thugs and Harmony, with them releasing their first EP titled Creeping on a Come Up, with the EP being a moderate success, peaking number 12 on a Billboard 200. But unfortunately, this would be the final major event in Eazy-E's life, because on February 24th, 1995, Eazy-E would be admitted to the Cedar c Medical Center in Los Angeles with complaints of a violent cough. When he would get there, he would find out he was diagnosed with HIV AIDS. He would announce this publicly on March 16th, 1995. It's still up in the air how he contracted the infection, even up to this day. With some alleging it was from another woman while being intimate, up to Suge Knight having something injected inside of him. Ten days later after the announcement, he would pass away from it. He was only 30 years old. He would die with an estimated net worth of $50 million. On April 7th, 1995, at Rose Hill Memorial Park in California, over 3,000 people would attend the funeral. Only DJ Yeller from the original NWA crew would show up to his funeral, which was very telling. Easy e would leave a lasting impact not on just hip-hop, but the whole music industry forever. With everything he ever touched becoming successful, from his days on the streets of Compton to becoming one of the founding fathers of gangster rap. Rest in peace, Easy e Until next time, luxury intent.